Hello and welcome to Walk in the Shadowlands podcast. Let me be your guide as we take a walk into the shadowy realms of the unexplained, the paranormal, of things that go bump in the night and haunt your dreams. Your hosts... I'm Mary Ann, and I would like to welcome you to our podcast. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, today, whatever time it is, wherever you are living in this beautiful world of ours. So sit back, relax, and let me be your guide as we walk into the Shadowlands together and discover what awaits us there. This episode came about quite unintentionally as I was researching the Patipare here episode. A gentleman's name kept popping up in my search results. Finally, I took the hint that spirit, universe, or whatever term you wish to use, was thrown in my face. Literally, with every search for information on New Zealand fairy folk, his name was there. I looked at his website and got his contact details. Took a deep breath and thought, well, the worst he can do is not respond. So I sent him a tentative email asking if I could possibly interview him for this episode and honestly, this is the first time I was ever nervous about reaching out to someone to appear on this podcast. Sometimes there are people who touch our lives in ways they may not even know about. Today's guest is one such person. I first heard about this gentleman back in the late 80s here in New Zealand and his words had a profound effect on the way I began to look at certain aspects of life here in this beautiful country of New Zealand. For many years he was a regular contributor to a now defunct New Zealand magazine called Rainbow News which was a spiritual sort of new age type magazine that I used to devour eagerly not because I believed in everything or even actually most that was written in there, but because some of the articles resonated deeply within me. It was from that magazine that I first learned about the still relatively little-known Kaimanawa Wall, deep in the middle of the Kaimanawa State Forest in the North Island of New Zealand. I really enjoy his work. He often gives me pause for thought. He has delved into so many of the subjects that my own personal path was walking before I even knew of him, a deeply, a very deeply spiritual man, both in touch with himself and with all aspects of nature around us. I'm very excited to be walking into this part of the New Zealand Shadowlands with this gentleman as our guide this time. So let's begin our journey. Many New Zealanders have it the very least heard of the gentleman who will be my guest for this episode and for further ones in the near future. This gentleman is regarded by some as a bit of a controversial figure, not least because of his views on how New Zealand was settled prior to the arrival of the Māori in their great waka or canoes. Sometimes his opinions can really polarise the views of many people. I simply enjoy him and admire his personal strength and ability to shrug off all the more negative comments people have thrown his way over the years. Because his life's work and research is absolutely not regarded as mainstream in the least. I'm so excited to say that my guest is Gary Cock. I was so very thrilled when he responded to my email request and very quickly as well. Within only a day or two... He suggested that we first have a chat on the phone, I think. He needed to suss me out and make sure that I was on the level and to get a feel of where my head and energies were at in all of this. We arranged a time to chat on the phone and honestly, I was so nervous before I phoned him. I have never felt like this before with anyone I have spoken with to date. But immediately he put me at ease and I felt comfortable like I was chatting to a very old and very dear friend. So we organised a date the following week to formally have a conversation and this episode is the result. Very timely also to be able to close off the New Zealand cryptid and more particularly the Patipare here episode. 
because, as you will all hear, Gary has had his own encounters with these beings. Gary is an internationally known author, speaker and documentary maker. He is a leading writer on the special nature of the mystic realms that are to be found in New Zealand. He has devoted many years of searching and writing of the wonders to be found within the islands of New Zealand and the South Pacific. His extensive journeys and experiences allow him to share much of the deeper nature of the forests, the waters and the mountains that allows us all to connect with the natural order in a deeper and more meaningful way. The author of two books in the Secret Land series and others, I honestly don't think that my guest has finished writing or producing documentaries yet. I feel there are more to come and I'm eagerly looking forward to them. Gary is a regular contributor to Australian and New Zealand magazines, offering readers unique glimpses of the sacred landscape of Aotearoa, New Zealand. He is a regularly requested speaker at conferences, both here in New Zealand and overseas. He has also created a number of documentaries and DVD recordings of the songs and the sounds plants, trees, poinamu or greenstone make. Gary says, My journey into our past has taken me into the land in ways that have surprised me. I have touched the stone and the waters and in turn be touched by them, traced the outline of ancient carved symbols with the tips of my fingers and been moved and been taken beyond the story of the spirit that is of this land and of its many people of yesteryear and now. Thus do the ancestors speak and thus are they honoured when we stand still and listen. Here is Gary Cook. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this, Gary. I'm really excited about this, and I've been eagerly looking forward to our conversation since we last spoke. Oh, that's, that's lovely, uh, Marianne. Uh, I, I thank you very much for your invitation to join um, one of your programs. I was actually saying to a friend that I was really nervous about speaking with you when I initially contacted you. And I think it's probably because I've followed you for so many years from the Rainbow News magazine days. And wasn't it you that wrote the article on the Kaimanawa Wall? Yes, it was. And that was um, virtually one of the first articles I wrote for Rainbow News. And that was, I think, about 1998 or 1999. So that's 20 years ago. Yeah, I've been following you since then, yeah. And that was quite significant to me in my spiritual journey, that Kaimanawa Wall article. It opened a lot of things for me. So yeah, you were a bit of a mentor, even though you didn't know me from a bar of soap. I've learned so much from you over the years, so this is really exciting to me. I told the members of my Walk in the Shadowlands Facebook group that I was going to be speaking with you and there was a lot of excitement around that. So you have quite a huge following of people who are aware of you and your work. That's interesting, the the fact that it seems to have um, gone on for so long because uh, I wrote um, a series of 84 articles over 12 years for Rainbow News And then, of course, uh, Rainbow News um, had to finish, and that was quite a few years ago. So it's interesting how uh, it still keeps flowing on, Mary Ann, which is wonderful because, as I always maintained uh, uh, when I was writing for Rainbow, and I often said to folks in my articles, um, you know, I'm I'm doing this for you, but I can't do it all for you. What I'm doing is sowing the seeds, and if I go to places, because in those days, my wife, Raymond, and myself were doing a lot of exploring around New Zealand and ancient sites. So I was saying, you know, if we can do this, so can you. So get off the couch or off the easy chair and grab the map and uh, go out and, uh, and have a look. So I was always trying to um, incite people to, to action and get out and do it for themselves. But, and also, Mariana, I, I always maintain that um, everything that I learned and everything that we saw and observed and uh, had a comment on, that we shared it openly mm. with people. You know, mm. nothing is to be kept secret and, and, and kept close. Sometimes we were given um, little stories by, by local Māori people and things like that, in which they said, you know, can you keep this close? Which, which we did, of course. We honoured that. So it was a very expansive time in my life, and it was just a, a wonder that I was able to to write, you know, for 12 years continuously for Rainbow. And the funny thing, I, 
I'm just going over a lot of my old articles at the moment. And I thought, my gosh, I've got amazing podcast material myself. So there we are. So I'm, I'm quite in, enlightened by what you're doing. And I just love what you're doing uh, with the podcast and, and your background, uh, as we discussed the other day. So I'm going to learn a lot from you, too. I'm always of the opinion that it should be a win-win for both parties in any encounter. And we learn from each other. That's always been my attitude my entire life. It may be nice for my overseas and some New Zealand and Aussie listeners, and I have a lot of listeners in the States, who perhaps may not be as familiar with you and your work, to have an understanding of how you started in this field and how you came to be where you are today. Well, it's a big, big story. Actually, Mary Ann, and um, I hope we've got enough time here. Oh, absolutely. Plenty of time, even if I have to make this into a couple of episodes. Okay, okay. Oh, that's fine. Right. So I, I, I guess my journey as such started as a very, very young person. For those of you who know New Zealand well, that um, uh, I lived uh, for a time in the Uruweras, which is a lake around Lake Waikata Moana, which is in the centre of the North Island of New Zealand. So as a child, I lived with um, local people there and went to school uh, in a small school at a place called Kaitaba. And as a 10 and 11-year-old, and so were all my, my friends, we free-ranged in the forest, in this magnificent forest of the Uruweras. And we ran around and we did all the sorts of things and had adventures that young boys do. But I now realize, of course, in hindsight, that this was sort of like um, an induction time for me because uh, I was learning so much. I had no fear of the forest. We used to climb up trees and lower ourselves on little ropes down into caves and things and explore. But we were always safe. We were always looked after. And so that, uh, to my way of thinking, was my introduction to what I call the natural order, um, the, the power of the forest and the land and the waters. And so then, of course, we, we go through life and um, all sorts of things happen to us. We have uh, traumatic events. And I guess one of the most traumatic events I had, which I suppose I can insert here, uh, this is just to give people an idea of how we overcome. Uh, and when I was about 16 and a half, uh, we had moved you know, from rural areas. We're living in the south of Auckland, which is uh, in the North Island of New Zealand. And uh, this is just after um, not long, five, six years after the end of uh, World War II. Shows you how old I am. And we're exploring around an old American uh, army base um, set in the uh, bush around the little township of Manurewa, where I lived. Anyhow, the long and the short of it is, as young boys, we used to fiddle around with things and we found live ammunition that the American soldiers had left behind. They'd dump hand grenades and all sorts of shells and things in the creek. And as inquisitive little boys, we were retrieving these things and looking at them and going ooh and ah. Anyhow, one of these objects that I was um, mucking around with blew up in my hand. And so, therefore, I was sort of, um, as a 16-year-old, quite devastated. Oh, wow. As you would be physical injury, uh, lots of body damage and things like that, bits and pieces fell off. So that was, um, I, I guess, my first uh, major traumatic event in my life. And I guess that this really set the scene for you know where I was going to go with my life and how I was going to develop. So then we get into life and uh, we go to work and um, things like this. And I fitted quite well into society, even though I was a bit sort of injured. And um, did all sorts of things. And I started off my career, believe it or not. I, I, it was wonderful that uh, a company took me into their fold and they employed me as a shoe salesman. So I started off my you know, career as a shoe salesman. No academic career with me because I lost so much time at school. So <clears throat> away I went and therefore pursued all sorts of things. And uh, I got into journalism and photography, photojournalism and pursued that for a number of years, and away we went, uh, getting married, and uh, of course in the 60s, and uh, having four wonderful children, and uh, right the way through. But then, I guess the next big thing, and this is probably the main thing which affected me in a deep, deep spiritual way, 
was I had what they call nowadays a near-death experience. I didn't write, quite realize at the time, but uh, in about 1973, 74 it was, uh, I didn't realize that I was allergic to bee venom. And I got stung in the back of the neck by a bee. And by the time I was rushed um, 15 to 20 miles to the nearest doctor from a rural area where we were living, uh, I clinically dead. Everything had stopped functioning. Right. So I was revived, but I had, I guess, what uh, is now known as uh, almost a traditional near-death experience. And I guess that this was the big opening thing for me. So from there on, right up to the present day, I'm very, very thankful uh, for that particular journey into those realms and the fact that I came back and uh, came back bewildered, unwell physically. Um, I was sort of laid in bed for, for weeks and weeks afterwards. And in those days, too, I might add, in the early 1970s, the near-death experience was not a term that anyone was aware of and I'd never read about. Right. And so that's what I had. And, of course, this then, as you can appreciate, Marianne, uh, opens up all sorts of possibilities in a person. Away we go, you know, and uh, then we trip off through life and have all sorts of grand adventures. So often it is trauma or traumatic events which happen in your life, not necessarily life-threatening. They could be emotional events and things like this. And sometimes these are events which trigger responses in people, deep responses. So that's just a little overview. So, uh, and then, you know, I've had a very, very uh, interesting life um, uh, up to date. I've just turned 80 a little while ago. So still going quite strong, although I'm slowing down quite a bit. I don't quite climb the mountains as I used to or lower myself into caves on a rope like I used to. I'm still active out there. And my main interest today, of course, is in the nature spirits, the forests, the elementals, the fairy beings, and also music of the plants, which I go out with little devices and record music and plants and things of that nature. So there we are. That's a little thumbnail sketch. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. And actually, if you had time, I would really like to do a whole separate episode on your music and work with the plants in this way, if you would be so willing to share that journey with my listeners and I. Yes, that'd be lovely. Yes. Awesome. I would really, really like that. Because I think that there would be a lot of people who would get who would get a lot of information about that and may in fact inspire them to go on and try it for themselves because and plus it's so darned fascinating. Mm. Today I think it might be quite nice to talk about because I've just finished a series, in fact, tomorrow in my last my episode on the Patipare here goes live. So it's perfect timing, actually, as Universe always does. This is perfect timing to have you on the show following that episode. So maybe you could tell us a bit about your journey with the Patipare here and working with the nature spirits and stuff like that. Certainly. I suppose that my introduction really to these realms, um, hindsight going back to when I was a child running around in the forest and the uh, Uruweras and also up on the east coast of Te Araroa, living in these rural areas and having free range uh, amongst the trees and the forests and, and, and the fields and the streams and the rivers and coastal areas, of course. <clears throat> As children, we, we, we were sort of, we imbibed nature. It was, we were comfortable within what we were doing. And I, I guess in hindsight that, I keep using that word, we were being protected, we were being guided, even at that young age, just with our play and our, our adventures that we had. And I suppose the first impact I had of uh, an occurrence from these other realms was back in about um, 1999, I think it was, Raymond and I had joined a group that were crossing over the Southern Alps, the mountains uh, in the South Island of New Zealand, carrying the sacred stone, the Poa Namu, the green stone, on the ancient green stone trails. And we were doing a five to six day crossing. Uh, we had two groups of 12 uh, with a guide. And so we were 25 people. And as it turns out, Raymond and I were sent ahead of the main parties uh, on the second to last day to set up our camp for the night, which meant bringing in firewood um, to where the fire was going to be set. 
and we're near a little mountain cabin and we're getting buckets out and bringing water from the river. So everything was set up. Now we were virtually a day ahead as it turns out. We'd been choppered in uh, by helicopter actually. So here we were and we suddenly found that um, being there in the early morning, we weren't expecting our party to come through until uh, later on in the day. So we had lots of time. So we did all the chores, got all the firewood in, the water in, and then we went to sit on the banks of the Wilberforce River. Now this river flows so beautifully blue, that incredible blue you get from glacial and, and mountain water. And it was a raging you know, sort of river. And we're sitting near the banks there, meditating, sitting side by side, looking out over the river, towering mountains all around us. And after a time, we got into a depth with our meditation and suddenly I heard singing and it was quite incredible. I could not make out individual voices, but I could hear like a choir singing. I could hear singing. And I sort of, it roused me from my whatever state I was in. I sort of came back uh, to the world and turned around to look at Raywin. And she was just turning around to look at me, opening her eyes. And we sort of said to each other, did you hear that? And she said the same, yes, I heard that, the singing. Where are the voices? Where are they coming from? The voices at this time had disappeared, they'd gone. But it was enough to enliven both of us to stand on our feet, look around. And the first of all, we thought of maybe in the rest of our party coming down the river, singing a trail song. But no, no, it wasn't. Um, they didn't arrive for another five or six hours. They were so far up the river behind us. So that was my first involvement with voices. I thought, how amazing. At that stage, I put this uh, encounter down to the fact that these may have been spirit guardians of the ancient Greenstone Trail, mm. and we were hearing their song. And then later on, I decided that um, it was more likely to be from the elemental realms, from the fairy realms, from the Patupayarehi. So, and this was substantiated um, quite a few years later when I was at a bush retreat uh, in the Puriora Forest, which is in the center of the North Island of New Zealand. And I'd settled down into my little bunk in my sleeping bag on one particular evening. And uh, suddenly there was tapping on the window right by my head and children's laughter. And so I thought, oh my gosh, what's going on? Because uh, amongst the group, there were some family groups and there were some quite young children. But this was quite late. Us adults had been up, you know, till about 11 or 12 o'clock before we went to bed. So I sort of stumbled out of bed in my sleeping bag and um, threw the curtains uh, back from the window and looked out, moonlit night, um, nothing there. I opened the window, looked up and down, and no, nothing there. I thought, oh my gosh, oh, must be some of those children have come to tap on the window, just having a little fun at my expense. So <clears throat> back I get, I just uh, into the sleeping bag again and just start to lie down and tap, tap on the window and laughter. So this time I was pretty quick off the mark. I wasn't rising from a deep sleep. I um, leapt up without stumbling in my sleeping bag, threw open the window, looked out again, nothing there. Sounds had gone. thought, okay, now if it's some of the three little children with their parents, you know, sort of down in the bunk room next to me, I'll dive in there and see what's happening. So I grab a torch down the corridor into the room there, stealthily and there are all the little kids and their parents fast asleep all snug in their sleeping bags and so i thought oh my gosh what's going on here so the next morning i mentioned this uh, encounter to the komatawa that was with us for this weekend he said oh he said that was the patapairehi i said what do you mean he said oh they often come around here i've experienced them an, any number of times and they're quite mischievous they will tap on windows and they'll have jokes at your expense. I thought, oh my gosh, what's going on here? So this really initiated a very, very big interest or deep interest in the Patapairehi and the fairy folk of the forests of New Zealand. And then I remembered, of course, at this stage that over my years of uh, roaming around New Zealand, I extensively investigating uh, ancient sites from ancient people, pre-Maori people, the Waitaha, etc. I had been collecting stories from farmers and hunters and things, just little notes about encounters that they'd had in forests and on the back of farms, etc. 
the sort of in the, you know, the, the fringe wilderness places of, of New Zealand. And so I started to look back over the stories and my gosh, there I had a wealth of information and anecdotal stories about encounters. And so often the encounters were uh, rural areas, uh, farmers at the back of their farms or hunters when they're actually on a solo hunt in the forest or maybe with their dog or two, but having encounters with little people that suddenly stepped out from behind uh, the bushes to look at them or little groups of um, four or five little people walking across a paddock and not realising they were being observed by the farmer. So, but one of the most memorable stories, uh, Mary Ann, that um, came my way, and this really, really triggered a lot, was, and this happened now probably about 10 years ago, and it was in April, it was, um, it was coming on winter, and this happened in the Waipua Forest, which is uh, in Northland of New Zealand, and it's quite a remote forest area in the sense that it's... Uh, a long, long way from towns and cities. And there was a, a good highway runs through it. And the particular story I got was that one evening, a Friday evening, at around about eight o'clock, and it was quite dark, there was a group of forestry workers. And these uh, young men uh, from the town of Dargaville, up north, had been away from home for the week working in the forests. Friday night, they were heading back for a weekend at home with family and friends. And so there were about seven or eight of them in this uh, minibus, three sitting in the front seat, the driver and two passengers, and then the rest in the back. So they're driving down through the Waipua Forest and descending down the road to where it crosses the river. There's only one river flows through the forest, and this is the Waipua River. And they're at about the third corner from the bridge. I know this quite well. And... Um, Suddenly, the driver came around the corner and had to slam the brakes on, on the van. And the van just skidded to a noisy halt, throwing some of the workers in the back into sort of disarray, you know, falling off seats and things like that. And everyone sort of came to very rapidly and to see what had happened. Why had he put his brakes on so dramatically? And then suddenly, when they all looked over the driver and the front seat passenger's shoulders, there in the headlights, the full headlights of the van, was a grouping or a string of children, as they thought, crossing the road in front of them from right to left. And they were looking, and the children walking across the road were coming up a bank down to the right, across the road, and up another bank between some big um, uh, kauri trees and disappearing. Now, there was no head count done, but the estimate was there was an excess of 20 children wow. in this particular, yes, in this particular group. So they were looking, looking, and then they started to chat amongst themselves, and, and the conversation sort of went vaguely, well, what are these um, children doing out here at this hour of the night, you know? And, um, uh, and then one, one said, well, where's, there's no tracks around here. Why are they walking around here? Uh, where's their teachers, if it's a school group or having a forest experience. Where's their torches? All of this was being said and bandied about. And they're just sort of coming to grips with the situation as the figures walked across, child-sized figures walked across in, in the headlights without even looking into the headlights, just going, just ambling. They weren't rushing or running across the road from the descriptions I got. And then suddenly one of the young Maori boys, because they're all young Maori workers here, he said, oh my gosh, I think that's the patapai dehi. And suddenly there was a silence in the van as some of the other Māori boys there suddenly swallowed mightily and suddenly there was a bit of a fear grip them because amongst um, Māori legends and stories, um, often the patapai dehi, the fairy folk, are portrayed as being uh, quite evil and quite mischievous and to beware of them. Mm -hmm. So suddenly there was silence and they were just looking and staring. And then the group tailed out and um, went across up the hill and vanished. And so the engine restarted. There was, one could call it almost a deathly silence amongst everyone that stopped chatting. And um, they proceeded on down the road to a place called Kai, Kaihui, um, where there was a, a tavern or a pub on the side of the road there where they always used to stop on the way home 
to have a beer or two. They didn't stop on this night. They went straight back to Dargaville. They were petrified. And those that we spoke to and got affidavits from, um, there was uh, two in particular who said that they would never, ever drive through that forest again at nighttime. So that was an extreme situation, Mary Ann. Wow. Credible firsthand story from seven or eight different people. Not that we interviewed all of them. We only spoke to about four of them. And um, so from that encounter came apprehension and fear. Uh, mm -hmm. From that encounter also came an incredible uplifting experience for some of those in the van. So it was a um, very much a, uh, a mixed you know, reaction. So that, of course, got me going. I thought, my gosh. So then I started to collate all my stories. I think, wow. Now, most of my stories came from around this area of Northland in the North Island. And um, because this is where I've been doing all my research work on the early people and my amateur archaeological work. So I've been working up there for quite a number of years. And so this is where the majority of my stories came from. I thought, well, there's certainly something going on around the Waipoa forest. So that really got us going. And from that, of course, um, we produced a... Uh, a 50 minute documentary. We went into the forest, I took a film crew in, and we looked at uh, trying to film. First of all, we filmed people telling us their stories. And then we spent uh, a few nights on locations in various forests, trying to um, see if we can capture something, not necessarily uh, on film, but even just with sound recordings. Mm. That was not uh, as successful as we would have liked because uh, I now believe that um, the fairy folk and stature of the Patapaurehi and the, whatever the fairy folk may be anywhere in the world, they're not just going to come out and pose for the camera. <laughs> they're not um, into the digital age in that sense. And so anything that um, you capture or see may be uh, quite accidentally. And that's what happened. We were filming a recreation of a woman walking through the forest, an experience that she had told me about, and we actually filmed something in the background of one of the shots, which was quite bewildering. So we did capture something. We captured sounds in the forest at night time, uh, odd sounds. So um, that was um, the big reveal as far as I was concerned. And then, of course, from that, I have now spent more time studying fairy stories from all around the world. I've actually joined the um, Fairy Investigation Society, which is based in the UK, and that. Wow. Uh, incidentally, incidentally, for your listeners, it's easy enough to join Fairy Investigation Society. Remember that name. And um, the man heading it up now is a, uh, a professor of medieval history uh, from Oxford University. And he, for the last six years, has been running uh, an international census on fairy sightings. And what's been coming in, they, they publish them, it's all freely available online, they publish all the responses they're getting from all around the world, and there's been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds from all parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And it's obvious that, you know, there's something going on there. There has always been something going on because all the indigen indigenous people uh, that we know of in the world today, and once you start to delve into their history and their legends, they all have stories of little people mostly little people and so often they are very very similar to the descriptions of the patapairehi in new zealand mm -hmm. and even to the um the little people uh, in australia very short in, in statue you know sort of um, three to four foot tall perhaps uh fair of skin fair of hair and um always very elusive only only coming out at night so there we are that's a bit of a rave there marianne but uh where i how I came to the, the Patapairehi side, yeah. That's a really great journey, Gary, and very interesting to listen to. I actually saw that DVD you were talking about. Could you please tell the listeners the name of it? And for all my listeners, it is available from Gary's website, which I will link on this episode's podcast website page. Yes, it is. Yeah, voices, uh, voices from the forest. It's a really awesome DVD for all you listeners. I recommend. I highly recommend that you purchase it. I think it may be 
also available from Gaia. Is that right, Gary? Yes, from Gaia online to, to view for just a small small charge, you can view it online. I think that is actually where I viewed it, as I was unaware of your DVDs at that stage, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And yeah, I particularly remember that scene where you captured that anomalous being. Oh yes, that's right there. Yeah. That was exciting. Very exciting. So for listeners, particularly those who have an interest in this area, I strongly recommend you go to Gary's website, look that up. Gary's website is called The Secret Land, Sacred Sites and Ancient Mysteries. The internet addy is www.secretland.co.nz. There's some really great information on there as well, and it will be linked on the episode page on the podcast website, www.walkingtheshadowlands.com, so you can go and visit for yourself. How long did it take you to make that documentary, Gary? It's amazing. We were a very tight team. There was myself, our director, Chris, uh, Christiana Van Wyck, and um, our producer, and our cameraman. There were four of us, and we travelled extensively over the North Island of New Zealand, and, and just in a period of three to four weeks max. So we went out, we interviewed people, we set up re- uh, reenactments of, of various stories that were given to us, and doing a lot of filming on site. Uh, during the day and at night. And then we edited, it took longer and longer to edit that. So the whole thing was actually done. You know, it, it's amazing what you can do, probably in about six to eight weeks. Um, because as you could appreciate, as your listeners may or may not know too, that um, it's all very well going out and doing all the filming and running mm-hmm. around and having all this fun. Then you've got to come back home somewhere and um, edit it all and put it all together uh, to give it a coherence. And, of course, then put in uh, background music and things like that. So all this had to be done. But we ended up, we did it on a very, very tight budget. I mean, we made a virtually a one-hour documentary, and I think we made it for about $50,000, um, mm-hmm. which um, in today's terms, you'd be looking at hundred to 120000 So we were just blessed by having people who were willing to to work with everyone, everyone was paid because all the costs of this go in, um, in uh, on-site costs, traveling around the country, accommodation, and paying everyone, paid everyone, everyone got a wage for the time we were out shooting. And then of course, you've got to pay for all the um, editing work, uh, which is done. And it came out so beautiful and, and such a professional job. Yes, they did a really awesome job. I do some video editing myself as a graphic designer. And so I know how much work goes into it. It's a very professionally done video. Not to mention it shows the beautiful land we have here in New Zealand. Can you perhaps share some other experiences people may have shared with you about the Parupārehe? Yes, I think I've got a couple of favourite ones, which um, I always love and these stories all, um, they reinforce each other with descriptions of, of what people have seen. And one, and this was, um, took place in the area called uh, the Panga Wahini Valley, which is out of Dargaville on the southern, uh, south um, eastern side of the Waipua Forest. And up this very long valley with steep sides going into planted forests and also natural forests are a lot of farms, dairy farms and um, that sort of thing. And this particular story which came out of the valley uh, was to do in a, um, a summer evening uh, after the farmer had uh, finished milking his cows uh, for the night. He, he and his 12-year-old son thought they'd go up the back of the property, uh, up the tracks here, up to the high part of their property to see if they could um, shoot a couple of rabbits from the pot. Okay, so they took their little single-shot twenty-two rifle and the way dad and the, and the son go, walking up the farm tracks towards the back of the farm. And it didn't seem to matter to them when they did this, from what I could gather. Whether or not they saw a rabbit didn't matter because the thing was they were just having such a, an incredible father and son time, you know, after a busy day on the farm. And so they walked right up the back of the farm to where their boundary fence it came along and it was a typical farming uh, type of fence. I think probably an eight, eight wire strand, number eight fencing wire, eight wire strand. 
and uh, which was to keep, you know, sort of um, keep uh, things like deer, if they were in the forest, coming in and what have you, and uh, keep all their cattle and perhaps their sheep in. So they came up to the up to this site, and this actually, this was a spot where they often sat because they had a magnificent view down the hill they'd just come up, right across the valley where their farm was nestled, the the the, the milking shed and 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 the farmhouse and little river flowing through the through the valley. And this was a resting place. So they sat down, leant against the fence there. And dad, of course, rolls himself a cigarette. And they're sitting there just taking in the beautiful evening view. And then he said, when he was telling us about this, that suddenly he became aware of the fact that the wire on the fence was squeaking. Now, as you know, that when you actually um, put a fence a farm fence together you've got staples which you put around the wire mm. and of course there's always movement in that and so suddenly the wires were squeaking um behind him and he thought my gosh and went squeak 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 he said well must be someone climbing over the fence so he leant well forward and looked to his right back up the fence which went, went up a, a, a slight rise and there he saw three little figures standing in front of the fence. Then he became aware that two more figures came over the fence with a very, very tiny figure. Very, very short indeed, he said. And he said, I was looking at them. They were just standing there. And his first thought was, what on earth are these children doing? Where on earth have they come from? I mean, uh, as he said, uh, telling the story, you know, my farm backs onto the forest. And there's nothing up there. There's no, not even any tracks. And the only people who go up there are hunters. And so he nudged his son and said, look at this. And so the son leaned forward too and looked up to the right. And there was five very short child, child-sized child figures and a little figure. And so then the figures started to move down the hill. There was a slope there in front of them and started to go down the hill. And the little figure was jumping and cavorting all round at their feet. And so this is when dad and the son stood up to step out a bit from the fence to have a better view. Now, this was taking place probably 75, you know, maybe 100 meters away, not, not terribly far, but enough light to make out the figures quite clearly. And then as they stood up and stepped forward, the line of figures was going down the hill and the little figure suddenly saw them and started to gesticulate and wave its um, arms in the air and move towards them. And this, of course, alerted the bigger figures to the fact that um, there were humans there. There was someone else there besides themselves. And so they quickly grabbed up the little one and um, ran straight down the grassy slope up the other side of the small valley and to where there was another stand of bush and disappeared. And the man said, well, it was almost as if they were taking a shortcut from one bit of a forest to the other, just climbing over the fence down there. <clears throat> and he said, wow, he said, the little figure that was waving and dancing, he said, with the way it moved and its attitude and it, it, it's the fact it was so active, it was not a little baby. It was the equivalent, possibly, of a three- to four-year-old child, but very diminutive. So he said that what I was seeing, what we were seeing, I don't know to this day. He said, I don't like to put names to it, but I was seeing uh, very, very small adults, very short adults with a baby, with a young one with them, and they just disappeared very rapidly down, down the hill, up the other side and into the forest. So that was one incredible sighting. And a number of sightings like that, and always around the main forest areas right. where um, um, they would come out of the forest uh, for water or something like that. So a number of stories. And that, to my way of thinking, was one of the most exciting stories that we received. Oh, that's pretty exciting. All right. It was. So it's, um, there was another one which was quite, uh, quite unique, and this was a solo sighting in the sense that uh, this hunter that we spoke to had gone to an area adjacent to the forest, but it was an area which 
uh, was all scrubland. It was very, very swampy in the old days. It had been drained, but it was still all tea tree and manuka and things like that growing. And um, <clears throat> he used to park his vehicle at the end of this um, farm track and go pig hunting and take a dog with him. So he got his rifle out and his dog and um, had the dog on a leash to start with until he got into the, into the bush. And there was a track that he followed to go into the deeper bush looking for, for pigs. He said, as we went in at the bush, there were a couple of, oh, what do you call those, pampas grass bushes mm -hmm. on either side, okay, with a great big long leaves, you know, dry leaves. And he said, he noticed that on both sides, all the leaves or a number of the leaves had been plaited and, into great big long strings, beautiful plaits. And he said, cripes, who's been here? Because once again, this was a place which was only accessible by driving over private farmland with permission to go and park up and then go hunting. So not a place where lots of people went. Right. Mostly just hunters who had permission to do that, do so. And he was one of the hunters with permission. So he said, okay, so away he goes to the forest and he lets the dog off the leash. And um, <clears throat> he hadn't gone very, very far, or well, not the forest, the tea tree and Manuka scrub hadn't gone very, very far, and um, the dog was still just around uh, in front of him. And suddenly, there was a bush on the side, a clump of bush on the side of the track. And he said, a small figure stepped out and looked straight at me. And then suddenly, it sort of looked at us and then turned around and ran off down the track. And then, of course, the dog saw the figure running and took off after it. Mm. And his, his first thought was, oh, my God. You know, there's, there's a, a child in here. I don't know where the child has come from. Once again, just looking at the stature and the height, what am I going to do? So he ran off furiously after the dog, which was still barking, disappearing in the distance. And I don't know how far he ran, but he kept on running. The dog had stopped barking and he said, oh my gosh. So he came around um, a little bend to a little bit of a clearing there on the, where grass was growing on, the, on either side of the track. And there was a dog laying down on the ground puffing and throffing at the mouth. And he thought, oh my God, what's going on here? And he went up to the dog and the dog was twitching and, uh, and going into spasms and just laying on the ground. He thought, oh my gosh, heavens, it's, something's wrong with it. It's either been poisoned or it's eat, just eaten something. And his first thought was, I'm going to have to put my dog down. Um, I can't suffer this. So no injuries on the dog other than what it was going through, throffing at the mouth and whining and, and spasming. So he thought, okay, I'll have to kill the dog. But then suddenly the dog sort of shook itself a bit and um, came round and um, stood up on its feet all wobbly. And the guy said, oh. So he put the leash on it and um, said, well, I can't go in the forest now after all this has happened. So he turned round to go back out the short distance he had travelled through the trees back to where his car was and quite bewildered about what had gone on. What had happened to the child, he just didn't even think about. He was more concerned about his dog. Mm. Obviously, the dog had not found the child and it sort of attacked it or anything like that. And then he came back out to go through the uh, pampas grass, which he passed through earlier on, where all the leaves had been plaited together in beautiful plaits. And he said he noticed mm. that all the plaits were gone. The leaves were just straight again. Mm. And so he got in his car and went home. So this was an event which happened, which was a mystery to him. He doesn't know what he saw. He was not willing to enter into any you know, sort of um, uh, deep observations. He thought he saw a child, it was mysterious. Uh, he didn't know about the Patapai Rehi or the fairy folk of the forest. So that was a, another side um, there where one of these little figures um, was actually chased by a dog. So, mm. It seems that the manifestation um, of the Patapai or the fairy folk or those that live in the fairy realms in a physical form, uh, if they are noticed and seen and they have come through, it's quite a tangible physical form and they just don't suddenly vanish in front of your eyes. I mean, this little figure ran and it's a bit like the early story I, I told you about the farmer watching the people going across the... Uh, farmland in front of them they just didn't suddenly dematerialize and disappear and the same with the figures in the headlights 
So when they're there, they're there, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. And if they are seen. So, and what really prompted me um, uh, listening to all these stories to go into forests and see what we could find ourselves was particularly in the northern forest around uh, Waipua. And this was the notion in my documentary to see indeed if there were little fairy folk uh, lived in the forest or was there a lost race of people, diminutive mm -hmm. people still living in the forest up there. So that's what we went to look at. Yeah. That is really cool and most interesting. Do you believe, Gary, that these patipari here are interdimensional beings that they can... I would say so, but a great description which is given in the documentary by a dear friend of ours, a uh, very, very uh, wonderful dowser who helped with our research work, he says they're incredible shapeshifters. Mm -hmm. And this is something which comes out in a lot of stories that you hear, uh, whether they're from New Zealand or overseas, uh, stories mm -hmm. from the fairy realms, that suddenly you'd be walking past a tree that you walk past, you know, often when you go for a ramble in the forest and on this particular day you stop by the tree and look at it and there merging into the bark as a small figure sitting there mm. so um shape-shifting in the sense that they i guess being part of the elemental realms if you like to look at that i mean that's another thing which is uh how do you categorize elementals as opposed to fairies okay mm -hmm. and within the fairy realms of course we have so many different um rankings and, and ratings you know sort of uh, what they look like and uh, names i've got a little book uh, that i brought back from england a number of years ago and uh, there's a list in there of 123 different names for different types of theories wow so it becomes becomes quite complex yeah, yeah. so it's um they're there and i think very much shapeshifters and i think though that if a person has a really strong uh interest and a desire to see them and, and meditates upon them, that one can definitely connect with them. I'm quite happy myself just to have heard them mm -hmm. and also to be associated with people who've seen them and see and, and talk you know, to them about their experiences. It does not matter a little to me whether I see them or not, right. or whether I film them or not, but I know they're there all the time. We've got a big forest uh, attached to our land here. It's part of our land. And I've got what I call the fairy glade where I go and sit down there. And this is where I have my contacts. And the responses um, from those realms, which are, as, as, you, as we're looking, or as you said earlier on, <clears throat> they're almost like parallel realms of mm. existence. Mm. And they are so close to where we are. I liken it to these realms. Are, uh, the separation is no thicker than a butterfly's wing. Oh, that's nice. It is so delicate and it is there and so, so easy if one applies themselves uh, with a genuine intent to actually um, see or share with these figures. I also feel, as I said in the um, documentary, um, even at that time and more so now, that there is a desire, I think, for communication with some of the beings in the fairy realms because of what humankind, mankind, is doing to the environment of the planet. Yes. Because within the biosphere of the planet, those realms share exactly what we share. And they share the same waters, the same land, the same fruits, and things of this nature. So I have a feeling that what humans are doing to the planet is impacting on the other folk. The, uh, yeah, ah, there we are. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. That's absolutely, that's really fascinating. And so very, very interesting, which brings up a whole, well, can take us, can take us off into a whole different tangent, like the elementals. I'm very aware of your time, Gary, and I could talk to you for hours because you are so interesting. I was thinking, would it be okay with you if we did a few interviews and you can discuss whatever you want? Like, I would really love to hear about your archaeological work, your Waitaha work. I'd really, really like to hear about your plant work. That's why the music of the plant, wonderful field. And that, that of course, touches on to the uh, elemental realms too, plant, the plant elementals. If you would agree to do that, I would be so excited to talk with you more.
Why not? Why not? No, because as I said, I've got so much I want to share. I'm always publishing things on my Facebook page. And um, that's a, a bit of a, uh, a, a sort of concern in a way because quite a long time ago, I maxed out on how many Facebook friends you can have, which is 5,000. And then, <laughs> then you're supposed to then set up another page, you know, do this and that. But I just uh, haven't got all that tech ability and I didn't do that. And so I've got 5,000 people on the Facebook page and I got, um, now I just suddenly discovered last week, I've got over 3,000 followers as well. So there's 8,000 people out there that I'm pumping out information through my Facebook page continuously, particularly uh, with fairy events as they come to light and also uh, with Music of the Plants because um, I have a program at the moment where going out on a regular basis into the land here, into our veggie garden. So I've just been recording um, uh, vegetable plants and um, posting that up so people can hear it. I've also got <coughs> over 40 short film clips available on YouTube. So pe people can just put up Gary Cook NZ and uh, go onto YouTube and just see what I've been recording over the last four or five years. Yes, I saw those clips. Yes, yeah, so th those are available as well, freely available. I'll put a link on this episode's page on my podcast website, www.walkingtheshadowlands.com, so people can access the videos via that if they wish to. Okay. Along with all your information, so I'll have links to your website and links to your Facebook page, as well as the YouTube page, links to your shop, so people can go and check them out for themselves. Is there anything else you would like to say about the Patipare here or your experiences with them before we close off this episode? No, not at this stage, because probably I could go on for another couple of hours. You know, but it's, um, it, it's interesting because uh, I, I think one's awareness, once one understands that there are little forest dwellers and garden dwellers are not, not only in the forest, they're in the gardens, they're in the landscape, they're everywhere. Mm. And these are not necessarily the, uh, the fairies that, the Disney fairies with little wings which flit all around the place. I mean, the winged fairies virtually um, are popularized, of course, so that's the, the Disney fairy, which is Tinkerbell. Mm -hmm. um, but going back to um, the turn of the last of the previous century in the 1800s when spiritualist groups were looking at the, at the fairy realms and things. So winged fairies came into being in the days of the spiritualist movement in the late 1800s and early 1900s uh, throughout Europe. Um, prior to that, going back into uh, medieval literature and stories and uh, stories from indigenous people around the world. They do not talk about there being winged fairies. They're all beings that um, <clears throat> resemble humans in shape, mm -hmm. but not necessarily uh, in demeanor or in physical aspects. But, you know, they, they stand like little humans. And this is where you get such varying descriptions, whether you're looking at goblins or whether you're looking at elves whether you're looking at dwarfs, whether you're looking at leprechauns. And so, and it seems too, and I think it's the same with the Patapayarehi, that the little people uh, of these lands take on very, very much, or emulate in a way, uh, the people that they live with on these various <laughs> lands around the world. So descriptions will be from Aboriginal people in Australia to North American uh, Indian people, the figures all look the same as far as height goes, and et cetera, et cetera. But they all have the demeanor or the physical features of small tribal people. Okay. Mm. Like, uh, yeah. So, um, but they're there. And um, as I said earlier on, just uh, for people to look at the uh, Fury Investigation Society, you don't have to pay to join up. And there go back into their archives and look at the last four years. And they've published three different census figures. And this is now hundreds and hundreds of people have been writing in from all around the world. And they've got the listings uh, sectionalized in, in various parts of the world. So it's easy enough to look up New Zealand or look up Australia or look up the US of A. And also uh, around the world, there are very strong fairy movements. Mm. Now, very high profile, uh, actually, in the UK, 
and around England, but quite a number in, uh, in North America, in the US of A and Canada, and not so much in New Zealand that I know of, just people of interest groups, um, they will talk about this. I suppose within um, interest groups, like say the Theosophical Society, etc., which have a very broad approach to everything esoteric, you know, they look uh, quite seriously on the fairy realms and uh, also some of their um, earlier research work, you know, done by uh, some of the early um, uh, writers um, talks quite openly about all this. So far as I'm concerned, they're all there. They're out there. They're around us all the time. Sometimes we may be aware of them. Uh, we have a feeling. It's a feeling that um, I talk about on the documentary, actually. The fact that... Um, at times when I was working uh, in forest areas and bush areas on my own doing archaeological research work, um, you'd get the feeling that um, you're being looked at, mm. you know, so strong. You're bent over doing your work, looking at your compass or writing notes down. And think, oh, my God, someone's actually looking at me. And you turn around quickly to see who's there in the forest behind you. But you don't see anything. But you know that you're being looked at. So that's a feeling which um, a lot of people uh, experience. Sometimes we experience that feeling when we're in a crowd of people yeah. sitting in an auditorium or something. And someone's looking at me and you turn around and sure enough, there's someone three or four rows back has been eyeballing you for some reason. Yeah. But in the forest situation, out there in the middle of nowhere, with no one else around, you don't see anybody, but you know there's someone there. That would be, that would be quite a disconcerting feeling, I would imagine. It can be in a way, but... Uh, over the years, um, I've been aware of the fact that uh, in certain places in New Zealand, in which um, have wahi tapus on them, that's the, the Māori um, tapu, to not, don't go, don't touch, keep out. If you go into areas like that or around them, uh, you can feel the presence of, say, spiritual guardians or the ancestors. Mm -hmm. And so this is something which is still quite strong among some Māori people today. Not only uh, their belief in patapaadehi, but also their uh, avid belief in the fact that there are spirit guardians still around, the ancestors. Some of the ancestors have not passed through. They still linger, and they are guardians of certain places for certain reasons. Right. So sometimes one could infringe accidentally on those areas, and you become aware of something which is a little different to a benevolent observation of the back of your head, right. rather than something which makes send shivers up and down your back. And um, for myself, I, I was given karakia to say, which is a Māori prayer, to say at such times as this, which would be to establish who I was and why I was there, etc. So that would take away any uh, sort of uh, fear that the ancient guardians had of me as an intruder. Right. That actually reminds me. I was just speaking with a lady the other day. She was a forestry worker and she was telling me of experiences that she and some of the workers had at a particular forest block in New Zealand with an elemental yeah. who was very angry at their presence because they had been disrespected and so they had so many things going wrong. People having accidents, machines breaking down, people's brakes failing, and it wasn't just the forestry workers. Anybody who went into that 30 kilometre area of the forest, beekeepers, people going to fix fences, all had accidents, had machines break, had all sorts of things go wrong with them. Even this lady had a very nasty accident that almost destroyed her ability to walk. And I will be doing another episode with her experiences in them at some stage in the near future. Yeah, there's, that's, that's a fascinating story. There's a number of stories that I've collected like that <clears throat> over the years. And the only way that that can ever be changed, because this is a, a very, very deep thing, and this may mm. be attributable to guardian spirits mm. uh, of a particular area, spirits of ancestors who have passed, but they're run. Um, the requisite placed upon them it was to remain there as a guardian for as long as it took to keep people away and frighten them away from an area. And that may have been because a particular type of tapu, like a wahi tapu, was put in place. And people, you know, there's no sort of uh, markers to sort of say, don't go, this is a tapu area. Not unless it's a modern tapu, but for old, uh, ancient tapus, you just don't know. Yeah. You can walk in. I remember quite a number of years ago, 
I was up north exploring some ancient volcanic uh, valleys, you know, great lava flows and things and big cracks in the earth. And I wandered into this particular valley, which was big lava walls, you know, quite steep. And I'd wa I wandered into a, a burial uh, area by mistake because suddenly there were hundreds and hundreds of bones and skulls sticking out of the cliff face. Wow. Oh, gosh, this is a place I don't want to be. And so I did a catechia and, and backtracked. But I did attract something. I took something back on my shoulder, which was seen by a, uh, a clairvoyant person who didn't know where I'd been. But they said, my gosh, you know, you're carrying something which you've got to get rid of. So this can happen as well. But this is not to be confused with the fairy realms. No. Quite different. Okay. I mean, I know of, of events. I mean, this is digressing a little here. And I've experienced this myself also. Walking into a place, not necessarily uh, in a forest area, but could be in a farming area, but there was a history, a Maori history, of a great battle having taken place there and a lot of people were killed. So there was an ancient story. And walking into this place, feeling a cold shiver uh, envelop the group of us. We all started to feel cold in, in the bright sunlight. And then we suddenly found uh, from a person um, who lived just down the road from the site, oh, he said, um, what's going on there? There's an ancient battle being fought there. It's on a loop. And the Māori there, tribal um, fighting, they are fighting a battle which was first fought two to three hundred years ago, and they're still fighting it on a daily basis. So mm -hmm. there is this at another level in the landscape but not to be confused with the elemental or the fairy realm. Right, right. Not to be confused with fairy folk. Yeah, I've spoken to people too, or also Mary Ann, who have um, been accosted by a Maori warrior, brandishing a spear and challenging them, just leaping out uh, when they walked onto an old par site. So these were can only be seen in this sense by very, very sensitive people. Mm -hmm. uh, but that happens, which is a, is a, would be a bit, a bit disconcerting. And I, I think if people have any apprehension about walking into a place, you know, sort of um, when they're wandering around in the land or in the forest, is just to even just apologise for being there and just backtrack, you know what I mean? Right, exactly. Okay, one last question before I let you go, and that is, have you noticed over your period of time working in this area, have you noticed that people are becoming perhaps more open and more um, accepting of other realities? I think so. <clears throat> there seems to be, maybe it's just the circles I move in, because I don't move in very broad circles anymore. My, my movement amongst people, like with yourself, is very focused, mm. but... Uh, like-minded people. I mean, I still go out and uh, give talks. And uh, earlier on this year, I, I did three workshops at the um, Voices of the uh, Sacred Earth uh, in Auckland there. I did three consecutive workshops. And I had about 80, 80 90 people at each, each workshop. Or not a workshop, it was a talk and a discussion. It was right. all experiential. And these were all like-minded people. They understand. As I'm talking to them, they're nodding their heads and they they know what I'm talking about. So there seems to be, you know, more and more people having an understanding. Mm -hmm. And uh, even just coming in touch with um, what I call ordinary folk out there, uh, if the subject comes up, uh, some people, they have a story of their own to actually share. And I think, crap, so I wouldn't have thought he or she, you know, had a fairy, fairy encounter experience, but they did when they were a child or something like that. And a lot of... Um, people do have, they've just perhaps forgotten the fact that when they were three, four or five years old, they did have an experiential encounter in the garden at the mm -hmm. or in the forest close by where they lived. So a lot of people have had this contact, which they just shelved away in the recesses of their memory. And then suddenly you prompt them to pull it out and they say, oh my God, I did have, this happened to me years ago. It only ever happened once. And I sort of say to people, um, if I get responses like that in the group, heavens above, you've already had a contact, you know, and if you wished, you can renew these contacts quite easily. So there we are. There is, um, uh, I think, a lot more awareness um, of contacts with beings and other realms, getting past the 
So it's a superstition of the Māori people because um, a lot of uh, iwi Māori still have uh, deep-set superstitions about the patapai rehi and how mischievous and how dangerous they could be. Mm. Uh, and others, of course, are, are very open and they oh, they even share, you know, their own childhood stories with you. I know that when I was researching the Patipaere here episode, I approached some Māori on online forums and I got some some very interesting responses, to say the least. Some are concerned that I was trying to appropriate their history, their knowledge, and it was a fair enough response. Yeah, they've become quite possessive. Yeah, yeah, but I see it as... It's knowledge that belongs to everybody. It doesn't belong to any specific culture or being. It's everybody's knowledge. Well, not everybody has the knowledge, but it's everybody's birthright by virtue of being human. I think there, I mean, when we use the colloquial term, uh, patapaerehe or turehu, there's about five or six different names yeah. that these little folk were known uh, of in, in Maori, uh, by Maori, <clears throat> if you just say fairies, you know. Um, they're not going to take umbrage. Right. You know, it, yeah. It's interesting. So, no, there is a, and I think it's probably the possessiveness of of stories which, which abound, and uh, some stories are, are being published. Uh, James Cowan published a lot of um, stories that he gleaned from old Māori man when he was travelling around New Zealand back in the turn of the last century, mm. pre-century rather, and um, 1905, 1906. So, and a lot of those stories were shared by the old man. Today, it seems that the stories are guarded by the queer, by the woman. Yes. And they're very protective, and they'll get back in touch with you. Yeah, and uh, they'll voice uh, their fear that something is being taken from or interfered with. And this may be around experiences that they've had personally. Right. Or the vibe of the old stories. And there is still, as I said, a fear amongst um, some of the people that these are not to be messed with, not to be spoken about. And yet I've spoken to um, old Maori, well, not myself, but uh, one of my fellow researchers interviewed an old Maori man up north many, many years ago. And he said, oh, he said, those little people of the forest, he said, oh, we chased them right up to the top of that mountain and pointed to a distant hill big hill in uh, North America, and said, ah, oh, that's where we chased them all up, then we ate them all. Whoa. So there we are. Well, yeah, yeah. Gary, thank you so much for your time today. This has been a really interesting conversation, and I, I absolutely enjoyed listening to you, sharing your experiences and your knowledge, and I really look forward to doing this again. Yeah, well, you've got a lot, lot of stuff here you can get back, all right? So, um, That'll yeah. keep you going for quite a few hours. Well, you're going to be busy. <laughs> yeah. You, you've just made my day today, and I've thoroughly enjoyed this, and I know my listeners are going to get a lot of pleasure out of hearing you as well, and it's nice to have this recorded on another medium so your words are there. Yeah. No, that's, that's good. I, I like that idea. Yeah. Well, nowadays, you know, with this, uh, the digital age that we live in, it, it's quite interesting with the... 40 or so little selfies because I, I've done, I, I do sort of a two to three minute thing uh, every so often just to some inspirational words which I want to share right. with people and um, I suddenly th think, I was thinking the other day, well I put those on YouTube they could be there for the next two to three hundred years Yeah, it's just like the written word Yeah, yeah the written word is going to live on even though the book may no longer be, the bookshelves will disappear from the library it's going to be in the uh, uh, archives, archival libraries, you know. Yeah. So it's fascinating, isn't it? It really is. And, of course, you never know who this is going to touch and who it's going to open doors for and what a difference it will make in their lives in one way or another. Well, also, too, I, I also love to get feedback from people with experiences that they've had because that all adds to the uh, information that I've got because I have a feeling that, you know, there could be another book here. I'm we're even talking about a follow-up documentary because now I actually have uh, access through uh, the Tuhoi people 
Wow. Into the Uruwera. So I'm just, just playing around with that at the moment. In the intro I wrote about you, I mentioned that I did not feel you had yet finished producing books or documentaries, not by a long shot. Probably not. In one way or another. So this is awesome, Gary. Thank you so much for your time today. You're, you're a, a, a lovely host. You do it so well. And uh, it just makes it so relaxed, and um, which is wonderful. Oh, <laughs> thank you so much, Gary. You have a lovely day. You too, love. Okay, bye. When Gary responded to my email and agreed to speak with me, I was so excited, and more especially as I had literally just finished recording and editing the Patipaarehe episode previous to this one, so his appearance in this podcast could not be more timely. And I am so looking forward to future chats with Gary to discuss his research into oh so many different fields here in New Zealand, on the Waitaha peoples, hidden archaeology, and his research into plant music, which is absolutely fascinating. So please keep an eye out for those episodes, which will be coming up in the future, as soon as I can reschedule time with him. Meantime, if any of you have any questions you would like me to ask of Gary on your behalf, then feel free to email me at shadowlands at yahoo.com. I'll be most happy to ask him any questions you might wish to ask him, and I feel sure that he would be most gracious in answering them. So get them into me quick smart so you don't miss out. Tonight is the first. We've had no break music. I didn't wish to disrupt the flow of the conversation with him unnecessarily. If you enjoyed this episode, then please leave a positive rating and a written review on iTunes. Who knows, you may hear your review read out at the end of one of these episodes. And of course, so you don't miss out on our next episode, which is a most interesting interview with a gentleman from Wellington who runs one of New Zealand's oldest and most respected paranormal investigation groups. Be sure to tune in for that one. Make sure you subscribe on iTunes Now Apple Podcasts, Spotify or your favourite podcasting platform so you don't miss out. If you don't have a smartphone, then you can listen to the episodes from the podcast website www.walkingtheshadowlands.com. For those hearing impaired, there is a full written transcript of each episode on the website so you don't miss out at all. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your workmates about our show. Encourage them to listen and to subscribe also. The more the merrier. And as always, I would love to hear your experiences or your thoughts and any questions you might have for me. Please consider supporting this show on patreon.com. You can check out the link on our website, check our Facebook page, like and follow for hints on our upcoming episodes. Thank you so much for listening. Tonight, today, wherever you are in this beautiful world of ours. We'll see you this time next week. Thanks for listening. 